guys can go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 17 while I pray for us. Lord, thank you so much for this group. I pray you'd be with our conversation. We learn more about you, learn more about us, and that, uh, Father, your will would be done this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we haven't met in two weeks, so I'll do a quick refresher for us. Get everybody back on track. So we are following Israel's movement out of Egypt. Now, they could have gone straight to the promised land, but they'd have to go through all the land of the Canaanites. And they weren't ready for that. They barely had a country, much less a military, and so they go south. And unfortunately, when you go south, you run into the Red Sea. And so now they got to cross the Red Sea. Now, what's going to be important is that this is where their first complaint comes in and they tell Moses well okay great our savior you rescued us from the hand of Egypt so that we can die here wonderful and then God says no I have a plan and he opens up the Red Sea and they walk across and as soon as they walk across he closes it back over the people of Egypt (laughs) and uh, they get across and then They say, okay, this is great. You've got us out of Egypt, and now you've got us across the Red Sea, but now we're thirsty, and there's no water. (laughs) So, oh, great, now we're just going to die of thirst. Thanks, Moses. And so Moses says, God, they're they're upset again. Can we do something about this? And God said, walk five steps. And they walk, and they see a giant oasis that God had prepared for them. Water beyond what you would imagine, especially in the middle of the desert. Even had palm trees. (laughs) Probably had somebody sitting there with a reclined chair waiting to feed you grapes, right? No, that's added on. That's not in there. Probably had a good ice machine. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. So they stay there for a while, and then guess what? They get hungry, and so they get mad at Moses again. Oh, great, Moses. Now you've just brought us out of Egypt and all this stuff so that we can die of hunger. Wonderful. Our Savior. Moses goes to God, and he says, God, I, I'm sorry, they're upset. What, what can we do about this? And God gives them what for the daytime? Quail. Or the quail. quail. And well, manna. And manna. Mm-hmm. And they eat quail and manna. They're going to eat that for 40 years, so I hope you don't really <laughs> care about diversity. <laughs> I've heard quail is good, but I don't know about every day for 40 years. <laughs> you have to try some different barbecue sauces or something. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that happened the last time that we met. And so now we are going to get into another time. They are going to move. Now remember, they have gone from Egypt down south towards the Red Sea, across the Red Sea, and now they're heading toward this big mountain called Mount Sinai or something really important is going to happen. And then they start heading up to the promised land. And so uh, we're, we're getting to some pretty interesting territory, a lot of neat stories. Two interesting stories tonight, too, so I'm excited to talk with you about those. Um, so the first one comes in this uh, time where they get thirsty again. <laughs> so Exodus chapter 17, verse 1 says, All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on, from the wilderness of sin, that's where they were staying, not the wilderness of sin as in like disobedience, uh, but the wilderness of sin is just a term, uh, that would have been a Hebrew term, honestly I don't remember what it means, but, uh, and it says they moved by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink, so Remember, they they have moved away from this nice oasis. Probably they were thinking, hey, let's just set up shop here. This is nice. But God has a plan. He's got more to do. So he takes them away from that. And one thing that I'm kind of curious, and the Bible doesn't specify, so I'm curious what you guys think. It says that the Lord moved them out in stages. Now we're going to learn quickly that the reason that he does this is because they're about to experience their first combat, their first war against a nation that they encroach. And so he moves them out. Most likely what scholars say is each day they would send out, because remember, you got 2 million people that you're moving around. And so most likely you're, they're moving out a group a day. Now, I'm trying to decide in my mind whether that is a military strategy. Would it be better 
if you know you're about to get into combat, to have groups moving or to be in one big group. Because at first I thought, yeah. In trees, we, you know, when you want to notify a call, you, you do a one call. Uh, how, they, how they spread a message, you know, with that many people, mm -hmm. to notify them if they were going to do anything. It would be extremely difficult. <laughs> and especially now that they're going out in groups. Um, and I'm trying to decide whether it would be an advantage militarily if they're in smaller groups where they can't be, I guess. I mean, it, if I'm a nation and I see two million people walking in a big group, I'm thinking, <laughs> no, not worth that, right? But maybe there's something about, you know, if you're smaller, you're less susceptible, you got groups coming in behind. I don't know. I mean, the battle itself is going to be only by the hand of God anyway, but... I just, I'm just curious which strategy I would pick if I'm having to move two million people across a uh, foreign land with enemies. If I'm moving in one big group or if I'm moving in small groups. But maybe it just also has to do with easier to manage 100,000 people a group rather than two million. I don't, I don't know. Animals and kids. And they, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it, it talks about that uh, God destroyed are all the people that left Egypt died there in the wilderness. In the first 40 years, they did, They all passed away because all the new people went in. But just think about the cemetery size. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't be, that would cover such an area. Yeah, well, and God's got them moving around all those 40 years too, yeah. so they're all gonna be spaced out pretty good. But um, I guess, I don't know what it's like burying someone in sand. I don't know if you got to go deeper than in dirt or what. <laughs> you would think the wind might dig them up. But... Well, I don't know what it is. Did they have buzzards in or did they have oh, I'm sure wolves there's... or bears or something? Whatever, you know, that would eat the human flesh. <laughs> but anyway, we'll move on. Uh, you know, God moves them away from comfort. And so you can see how people are probably irritated at the beginning when Moses says, all right, we're heading out. The, remember, they're, they're following a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, and the Lord heads out, so Moses says, all right, we're going. And I'm probably one of those people. It's like, going where? This is amazing. Let's just make this Israel. This looks nice, you know. Um, and I think we can get in that mindset sometimes where we might have a goal or we might have something that we know God wants to do, but we get in a spot where we're comfortable, and so we say, well, it won't be too bad if we just stay here. We're okay. So there's no water where they end up going. So you can imagine Moses. These people have already griped and complained countless times. And now he sees the camp and what he doesn't see is water. And he's thinking, oh, no, here we go again. So therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? I'm, I mean, <laughs> over dramatic people. Yeah. I would have been, you know what? Go back to Egypt. Yeah. Take your tails, turn around, go back where you think is better, right? The fact that these people are not only saying, Oh, we've just come out here to die, but no, this has been your plan. You, you just want to kill us, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, that's why Moses came to Egypt to go against Pharaoh and deal with everything, was to kill them in the middle of nowhere. Um, but Moses, you, you see him respond when they gripe. They're like, I don't know why you keep griping to me as if I can do something about it. Why do you test the Lord? Don't you know that he's provided every single time? Why do you keep doing this? And so Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. So the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile, and go. And so Moses, he, he says, look, if, if we don't do something, they're going to kill me. Uh, they are so upset. They're, they're, you know, maybe even trying to start a, a, a revolution here or, or an, an anarchy, and they're going to stone me to death if we don't do something about this. And so... 
uh, he says, I want you to get you and the leaders and I want you to walk. And it's pretty interesting um, that he says, pass on before the people. So he wants to make sure that everybody who is in the midst of wherever their camp is at the moment is watching Moses and the elders do this. He wants them to see what's about to happen. And he says, make sure you bring your staff. That's going to be important. Behold, verse 6, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so. In the sight of the elders of Israel, he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? So first of all, I'm curious what you think that looked like when Moses hit the staff with, or hit the rock with the staff. You think water like shot out in like a, like a geyser type deal or do you think it was like just a poked hole in water? What, what comes up in your mind when you think of that? Probably a geyser. I yeah. Oh, so like it just came up from the top and trickled down? Oh, oh, the water. Okay, okay, I see. Well, if two million people is going to drink right there on that spot, you know, it's going to take a lot of water. Yeah. Where the outer people get trampled. It's going to have to be a big stream. Mm-hmm. See, in my uh, immature mind, I think I, he, like, pokes a hole in water, just goes, <laughs> <laughs> which sounds dangerous. But um, anyway, God provides, and he provides ma- miraculously. And, and the theme that has been so obvious throughout this whole entire story of Israel is God is going to take them through situations in which it looks impossible for them to get out of because he gets the most glory when that happens. He has to do that because they won't believe any other way. Yeah. And they're still not believing, even in the midst of all these miracles. And I would hope that you and I would see this and trust the Lord, but I don't know. Um, When I first moved up here and COVID hit and stuff like that, I had thoughts. I was like, oh, great, wonderful. (laughs) Brought me all the way out here for nothing, huh? Um, I'm going to be jobless here in a week. I thought that. I did. did you really? Really? I, I thought we'd put you out that quick. <laughs> okay, not a week. Not a week. But I, I expected, I mean, when you can't meet as a church, how does the, you know, who would have thunk that we would have been in a better spot financially when we came back meeting together after something like that? That was God's thing. It was. Yeah. And that's what God does all the time. And I, and I hate that. I didn't trust in him when that happened. But in my mind and in my heart, I doubted. And these people are doubting. And they continue to doubt. Even though God has said, I will use miraculous ways to do things, accomplish my purposes, so that you know that it's me that does them. Yeah, we do. Have you noticed that you know, we talked about the first time, you know, it was without water, you know, that God provided. He, and they didn't believe. He brought them right back around to the same situation, and they still didn't believe. Yeah. You know, there's a minister years ago, and I can't think of his name. He said, if you don't pass the test, God will bring you back till you do believe. <laughs> <laughs> Take the test later, huh? I just said, Moses, do not lose the staff. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, you, uh, obviously this power came from God, but if I'm Moses, I'm putting a chain on that thing. That's right. <laughs> you know, when I think about that, uh, I think about the fact that, you know, I have JD with me throughout the summer. And every morning, without fail, are we going to eat breakfast today? <laughs> every morning. And what do I, I say? The stereotypical thing have you ever not had breakfast? <laughs> No? Then what makes you think that we're not eating breakfast today? I don't know. I'm sure I did that when I was a kid, too. You know? 
everybody makes me feel bad. My child thinks he's not going to eat. Never missed a meal in his life. But the fact is that we do that to God. We think he's not going to provide when he does every single time. And like what Toby was saying, I, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that, if, especially if you're not spending time with the Lord and you're not in the spirit, then you don't see things in a spiritual way. You just see what's right in front of you. And many times what God has right in front of you doesn't look like enough. And a lot of times it's not enough. You have to wait for the Lord to provide miraculously. And he always will, especially to those that he loves. So, um, And the patience that he has with his people. Like I said, if I'm Moses, I'm done. <laughs> this is not worth it. Mo remember what Moses left. First of all, Moses isn't a young buck. He's he, he spent 40 years in Egypt. He spent 40 years in the wilderness in his last 40 years he lived to be 120 so he spent his last 40 years with these monsters in the desert <laughs> so 80 years old you want to go out and lead 2 million people through the deserts in Egypt well, doesn't it, cause it's been a long time since I read this but this, is this a place where Moses struck the rock in anger not yet no. that happens again that happens again right before they are about to go into the promised land. The reason, the reason Moses couldn't go to the promised land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very similar situation. Yeah. Um, but we see that Moses, you know, and, and, and that's a testament. We'll get into that too when we see that. But it's a testament to leadership too that when you have a people that is just continually testing you and pressing you and causing you angst and trouble, it weighs on you. And it becomes more and more difficult, and your patience wanes. And it's hard to get that back. And we see that by the end, Moses, he's just so frustrated. Even though God says the same thing, I want you to go up, and you want to strike the rock. You know, this time, maybe he did something like, and the second time, he... <laughs> so... Uh, any, any thoughts or questions on the story of the water from the rock? Total, you, total miracle. Well, you know, it looks, it looks like, of course, we realize that God knows everything and everything is going to happen. Why? Well, he knew that they were going to have to have water. Yeah. That's the that's a most likely thing that they ever need is water. But, you know, how many days do they go without water? Yeah, we don't know that either. Yeah, don't say that. We don't know that either. Um, it, it could be a while. It really could. Um, and it would be harder to trust that the Lord's going to provide as you get more and more thirsty, right? <laughs> to trust that God's he, He's going to give you what you need. It may not be the abundance of what you need, but it'll be enough. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. It just says they got thirsty and they got upset. They got hungry, they got upset. They got trapped between the sea and the mountains and they got upset. You know, When a trial came, they lost their confidence that God was leading them. They forgot all the miraculous things that God had already done. And that's why God is so diligent. Please remember what I did for you. And I think a lot of people... <laughs> I think, I think a lot of people think that these things like the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and all of these feasts and, um, and, and like the Lord's Supper and, and stuff like that that we do today, it's all about, it's only about, you know, God getting glory, but it's not. Yes, it's about God getting glory, but it's always, it's also about us helping us remember what God has done. And God, through all of these things, when he brought him out of Egypt, all, the death of the firstborn son, the unleavened bread, he's like, I promise you, if you don't do this, you are going to forget who I am and what I've done. And people do. And I do today, too. We forget what he's done in our life. The moment a problem arises. The struggle of being a human being. Thankfully, his patience doesn't ever go away with us.
goodness. <laughs> yeah. And I imagine he's given Moses some supernatural patience too to get through this. Because I don't know how I'm going to be at 80, but I'm not going to want to deal with this. I guarantee you that. <laughs> and then that last phrase, I think, is really telling. Um, they said, they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? You would think that he would very obviously be among them. But the moment something doesn't go right, they say, is God even here? You ever, had, you ever seen somebody do that with God's existence? The moment that something bad happens in their life, they think, is God even real? Well, that's a bit of a brash one, but I've seen that quite a bit. Something bad happens, a loss of a loved one, or loss of this or that, and, and maybe not God's not even real, but the question is, is God good? Does he even care? Does he even care? You question God's motives when some doesn't work out the way you want it to. They probably said that a lot when that building collapsed down there in Florida. Oh, in Florida? You see it around the disaster area, and you hear it from a lot, a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Why did, does God not show his love or his is God real? I mean, all these kind of things. Why would a good God let that happen? Yeah. How come is he could let something like this happen? Yeah. My cousin lived right... Well, I got two cousins. Or there's more than that down there in the forest. The, the one that was living there next... They say you could actually feel that ground shake when that happened. Oh, sure. I'm not saying there's probably a cord you could cut that probably warrants any warranty or Wednesday night. It was parked right there today. Parked right there. It used to do it all I can go exercise it if you want me to. Some type of demon. With the keys in it, somebody will take it. Okay. We will uh, we'll move on to this next section where Israel encounters their first battle. Now remember, what weapons did these people walk away with? None. They were slaves. They didn't have anything. They walked away with their clothes. That was about it. And maybe as they're spending, you know, at this point, I think we said we're about a month, a month out from their uh, escape from Egypt. And so brand new country, brand new people. Maybe they've had some time to develop some tools and stuff like that. Um, but remember, they're not doing any farming. God's providing everything supernaturally. And so they don't have equipment. So you run into a uh, solidified country that's been there for a while. Uh, that could be intimidating. Well, they brought out a lot of gold and jewelry. They did they do didn't that. Have no, no place to spend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't find a Walmart. <laughs> Dollar General store was too far out there. Too far out to Dallas. You wouldn't have to worry about that now. There's a Dollar General there five miles. <laughs> There's probably one over there in the middle of the desert in the Middle East. So we're introduced to the Amalekites. These are descendants of Esau. Anybody know who Esau is? He's Jacob's brother. Jacob's brother. Remember the story of the uh, the soup, the lentil soup, and Esau gave up his birthright to Jacob. Esau was hairy. Well, Esau also was blessed because he was a descendant of Abraham and developed into multiple nations. Now, those nations are going to cause issues um, as time goes down the line. But the Amalekites are people that come from the line of Esau. And it says they came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And I saw that they actually know where this is, but I saw the name of the country, and I've never heard of it before, so I didn't think too important to remember it. But if you're interested, you could Google modern-day Rephidim, and they actually know where this battle took place. Mm -hmm. Um, based upon the geography of 
some of the other passages in the Bible. And it, Moses said to Joshua, we're introduced to Joshua for the first time. Joshua soon becomes Moses's right-hand man and, and really faithful servant to him. And it says, choose for us men and go out and fight with uh, Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. And so Joshua has the uh, difficult task of putting together an army with no weapons and going up to fighting these people. And Moses says, I'm going to go to the top of the hill and stand with the staff. Now, we don't know exactly if he knows what's about to happen or not. He just, like Kyle kind of Larry said, he's going to have his staff wherever he goes. He's taking it with him because the Lord seems to use that often. And so he's like, I'm going to wait at the top of the hill and I'm going to watch. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And I found out that I forgot his sister's name, but Moses had a sister, and this was his sister's husband, is her. Mary. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and so Moses and his brother and his brother-in-law are up at the top of this mountain watching as Israel has their first battle. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. I always wonder if Moses just happened upon this, where he was just like, mm. oh, they're doing really well. And he comes out and like, oh, really bad now. You know, how, how in the world did he figure out he's got to hold this staff in the air? Um, I'm sure his... Uh, people out there with him are like, Moses, put that, put that staff back, back up back in the up. air again. <laughs> Look at that. Look what happens when you have, you know. And so it... And it's difficult to hold your hand up with something in it, you know, for hours at a time when they're all down there fighting, mm -hmm. killing each other, you know. Especially at his age, yeah, that, that's, that's a task. Um, Let me ask you something. Do you think that why the Malachite's uh, no, Hamalites uh, come after them at that point. That they knew that the promise that Esau had sold, you know, his birthrights and stuff, would have been theirs if he hadn't had done it. There definitely was animosity there. They knew who they were. Yeah. Um, and when they left Egypt, they had enemies, not just from Esau, but also from Ishmael, mm -hmm. uh, Isaac's brother. <laughs> and all the people that could have been part of that line to be as blessed as they were. You know, they, it, it's not the greatest start whenever you come out of the gate and you've got enemies that are coming after you. Um, so it very well might be the case. The Bible doesn't say that specifically, but they were descendants of Esau, so they would know the God of Abraham. They might even believe that it's their right. Um, but at this point, Israel is widely known especially you can imagine maybe maybe a month out it's not moder in that time period world known what has happened in egypt but words probably getting around and when you see two million people walking across the desert you're gonna have questions and so they found that whenever moses held up his hand with the staff they prevailed when he lowered it amalek prevailed so but moses's hands grew weary of course they did so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So all day, the entire battle lasted all day, and when the sun went down is finally when the battle was over. And I love this picture Moses, as solid of a leader as he is, as strong as he is, as faithful as he is, and he needs help. He needs people to hold him up when he feels weak. Mm -hmm. um, if Aaron and her hadn't been there, they would not have won that battle. But Moses needed help. He was human too. Um, and, and I love that testament because whether you're the leader of a household, you're the leader of a church, leader of a work, whatever it is, um, I know that I'm the personality that I want to put everything on myself. And then um, when things get overbearing and when I get tired, bad things can happen. 
I can get burnt out. I can, I can get frustrated. I can quit. All of these different things. And so that's something that really speaks to me is that Moses in his leadership had people around him to help him lead too. Because even leaders make mistakes. Even leaders get tired and weary. Um, and they need people to help hold them up. And so um, I, I, I really enjoy that idea that's put in there. Verse 14 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Elimelech, from generation to generation. Now, the Amalekites are not going anywhere. Uh, they're going to win this battle, but it's not going to be until King David that they f are finally obliterated. King David knocks them down to about 400 people that scatter off, and they just kind of disintegrate into history. But uh, they're going to be a problem uh, for the foreseeable future. But again, God says, I want you guys to remember what has happened here today. And so write this down. This is the first time God has told Moses to write anything down. Remember, for the history of the Jewish people, they haven't written anything down yet. They don't even have really a written language. And so when God says to write it down, most likely where Moses learned the ability to write was from the Egyptians because the Egyptians were the most prolific writers of all ancient history. They have the most writings out of any um, ancient people group. Now, their writings were holographics, and, and we can't read them today, unfortunately. Um, but it's interesting to see that, you know, in God's plan of creating this, there would have been nobody to write these things down had there not been an Egyptian that knew how to do that. But then they also had to be an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham. So the fact that Moses fit both of those standards or that an Israelite would grow up in a place of Egyptian uh, academics where he would be able to write, nobody else in Israel would know how to write. And so just a really neat story of how God put Moses through what he put him through. And then he says, write this down. Well, it's lucky that Moses knew how to write. And, and this is where we see Moses start to write out not just what God has done here, but uh, tradition holds that he wrote out the entire um, Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, Jared? Yeah. I, I want to bring your attention back to 16. It says, you know, the Amalekites from generation to generation, you know, they'll war with them. You know, we're seeing it still yet today over there in Israel with the, the Muslims, which that I've been told that is from the Esau. Is Islam connects with Esau and Ishmael. They they kind of, you know, they it's a bunch of different small religions that about I think around a thousand BC maybe they start to form what would become modern day Islam. Um, but it was all of these small religions whose dad was associated with Abraham in the line um, that would kind of form together. Oh, you believe what we believe. You know, oh yeah, we're a part of the rejected line and they kind of formed the religion off that. But, uh, but you see this, see what we're saying today, it was prophesied right back then. Yeah. The Lord will have war with them. Like, so so, may, so you're saying maybe it even goes beyond when King David does away with them to modern day um, the Malachites, which would be Islam. Possibly. Possibly. Um, here where it says Moses built an altar and called the name of it the Lord is my banner do you know what a banner was in ancient culture if you've ever seen a movie um, an army that's moving will have like a big stick and it'll have like a Something, some type of canvas attached to the stick with like a logo of whatever country that they represent. Banners. Banners. Yeah, yeah, they were banners is, is what they were. Um, now, we use banners now to, you know, commemorate famous athletes or memorials or 
churches sometimes have banners and stuff like that as, as memorials. So it's the same thing back then, but back then it was mainly used to signify who you were, um, what country you were a part of. And so I thought it was really neat that Moses puts on his banner. Now, this is a memorial. It's not an actual banner that they're carrying around, but he makes a banner and calls it, the Lord is my banner. So instead of having some type of emblem for a country or something, it's just the words, Yahweh is my banner. And, and the name of the country, you know, uh, is God. We are God's people. You know, we are the people of God. So Moses really gives God all the credit in the world there for taking care of them. We are God's country. <laughs> That's kind of a, a modern-day country song now. <laughs> Oh, I've we already got it. Over a, it today, he knows some of his songs. He I just didn't know who he was. I know some of his music. He did not know as much as I feel like he should, but he knew some. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I said I enjoyed it. Yeah, I was told that Alan Jackson was dead. He is not dead. No. <laughs> See, I hadn't heard that before. Oh, yes. I know. He originally made that tape as a gift to his mother and his mother-in-law. And it was so successful, he, he never dreamed it. So he wasn't even going to put it out originally. The gospel tracks? Yes. And he ended up making a, at least $100,000 donation to his mother and mother-in-law. Oh, wow. Just for the money to come off of that one album. And it still sells. I've got, I've got the one, uh, the first album he put out. There's actually three of them out there. I was thinking he made another. I will say this: I haven't done enough research yet, but he does sing the one song that I have a large pet peeve with, and it's that "Where I Come From," corn bread and chicken, because he sings that line. Working hard to get to heaven, where I come from. I don't like that. That's works-based salvation. But I'm not judging him off of that. You're probably wrong. <laughs> <laughs> See, I never made that connection. Never thought about that. Yeah. He has. Anytime it comes on in the car, he's like, I don't like that. <laughs> it's a song. Any thoughts, questions, anything we went over tonight you found interesting? Just curious. It just shows the power of God. <clears throat> you know. So if we're tested to believe, we better believe. Yeah, it's so interesting that God shows us his power so often and still yet. Um, our trust in him goes away when things get scary. Yeah. Why is God doing this to me? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's very common to think that we know how God should act in a certain <laughs> situation. And when he doesn't act the way we want him to, we think that he's done something wrong. Yeah. The way we tell him to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or even rejecting him entirely. Like the boy that I talked to that went with us to youth camp and said, I don't believe God's real because he calls himself a father and I don't like my dad. Oh. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to why you think God's not real because you don't have a good dad. But it was really not that he didn't believe that God existed, but he didn't like the idea of, of God being a father because his father was non-existent, you know? Yeah. Just a really strange connection. But again, what is that? That's putting expectations on God and expecting well since I didn't have a dad or a good dad or my dad was abusive then God must not be real or God must not care about me yeah. and it's hard to talk to people about that because we want people's life to go well and kids to have a good and smooth childhood but so often what do we see in scripture God takes people through sometimes what seems like impossible circumstances but when they come out on the other end and they're believers and they're strong and they're faithful, God gets all the glory. Yeah. Just an impossible situation.
because y'all's story is more kind of like just like the water from the rocket the the way out kind of came out of nowhere you didn't see that it just kind of popped its head out and you said oh okay yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of the point, too, with Moses and the rock. No one thought, man, Moses, he's pretty smart for smacking that rock with that stick and getting all that water out. No, people thought, there's something more powerful than what I just saw going on. But still, it didn't make a believer out of all of them. Well, it made a believer out of them as long as their needs were being fulfilled. Yeah, as long as they got the water. They believed in God while it was beneficial for them. Mm -hmm. Well, all those people that was back there around the curve didn't see that. Well, that's an interesting point. It is. Because it says that God made Moses and the, the people go in the midst of them, walking between them to the rock uh, so that they could see. But if you got two million people, unless you got some type of stadium, big screen, <laughs> big screen yeah, got some monitors around, uh, I don't think everybody's seeing that. Um, but I think at the very least, one reason that he told Moses, hey, you need to take your leaders with you, is he definitely wanted the leaders to see that because um, they needed some reinforcement too. Mm -hmm. Because again, remember what they left. They left, if I remember correctly, 12 or 14 fresh streams of water and palm trees to the middle of nowhere. And you're following a guy that's following a cloud, and I'm thinking. <laughs> what, let him be and he come at him? <laughs> yeah. Well, we can criticize them, you know, they, they'd see things happen, and they're all excited. But their faith just wasn't there. And we have the same problem, you know, as long as things are going good. Yeah. But our faith dwindles when things aren't going good. God waits till the last minute sometimes to solve the issue, just like he did them. In our own lives the same way. It's like what you went through or you're wondering if your check was going to come in. Uh, you know, and, and God keeps, God didn't do anything to change that, but we limit his power. I think we limit what we can accomplish with him because we don't give him a shot to really do everything you can do. And, and what you said, I think, is important, too, that God th sometimes does wait till the last minute because it increases, yes. it increases our patience. Yeah. Because like we said um, in that chapter where they're first thirsty and they start grumbling and saying, oh, we're going to die of thirst. This is awful. The way that the Hebrew wording says is they just walked a few steps and there it was. You know, But it, they were at their wits end. They couldn't handle anymore. And if they would have just taken a little bit longer, they would have found that. Um, but God is obviously increasing the patience of these people because he knows what's about to happen. And they're going to spend a little bit of extra time in the desert. Um, but yeah, he, he, his timing is very rarely what we would like it to be. Anybody else? I think to raise some money, um, we might sell some Moses staffs, and I'll bless them. <laughs> Send them out. <laughs> now, Garrett, are you going to be considered? Hey, do you want to be considered with a TV evangelist? Uh, you know, <laughs> we don't have to guarantee that it's going to work. We can just say if people have enough faith, then they can split their pools. What you know? <laughs> okay, let me pray for you. And we'll be dismissed for the evening. Father, I thank you so much for this group. And I thank you for our conversation and our study tonight. I ask that you um, will bless them for coming and reading your word and the power of it. And I ask that, that your word would continue to change us and mold us into the men and women that you want us to be. That we would have faith and patience and that we would remember all the wonderful things you've done. We would know your power. We would recognize your power and we would rest in it. Um, so, Father, be with them as they go about their week. Be with their drives home. And I ask that they would give you much glory this week in Jesus' name. Amen. It's always